This holiday season, give a present to your loved ones that has lasting impact on their spiritual lives. The Jesus Listens gift set. This one-of-a-kind purchase includes a hardcover version of Jesus Listens, a spiral-bound journal, 30 prayer cards, a magnetic notepad, a matching scripture pen, a set of 10 note cards, and a matching gift bag. Make gift giving easy this year. Order today from christianbook.com. We would live in a completely different humanity if everybody was waking up every single day going, hmm, I wonder how I could be more like Jesus in my life. And listen, we're humans. We're not going to get it right every day. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to you know, say things we don't mean. We're going to feel things, jealousy, rage, you know, all of that stuff. We're humans. But if we keep coming back to, and that's why spiritual practice is so important, because you keep coming back to, to how did Jesus live his life? Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. All of us have experienced what we like to call gut feelings. At various times in each of our lives, it's been that deep intuition that perhaps moved us to make a decision that was good for us, choosing one thing over another, or avoiding a situation that didn't feel quite right. Other times, perhaps we didn't follow that quiet tug on our hearts and pursued a different route, maybe ending up in a less than ideal result. However we view those gut feelings, the message is the same. God will always find a way to reach us. He is that still small voice that Elijah heard and in our lives often presents itself as that deep intuition about who we are and what we should do. Our guests this week had those gut feeling moments that they ended up following that led to some pretty amazing things in their lives. Hallmark actress and producer Nikki DeLoach tells about her singularly focused dream to become an actress and how she also felt the pull to tell the stories by learning how to produce projects as well. Pat Bradley worked for Crisis Aid International Ministry for years, helping people all over the world. But it wasn't until he felt the unexplainable tug toward helping people in a place no one else wanted to go that he had to trust where his heart was leading him. These guests both found that the more time they spent in conversation with God, the more they could trust the still small voice of their intuition to lead them to the right place. Let's start with Nikki's story. My name is Nikki Deloach, and I am a mom of two boys, Hudson and Bennett, and I'm married to Ryan Cattell. And I started in the entertainment business when I was a kid. I really fell in love with movies as a very young child. I would spend the weekends with my grandmother who lived right down the street and we would go to the local video store every Friday after school. We would rent three videos, three VHSs, and we would go to her house and I would watch them over and over and over again. And she got me into dance, into singing. You know, she put me into pageants, which I did not love, but I did love the part of pageants where they allowed you to perform if you had a talent, right? Winning a couple of those took me to New York and took me to LA, which led me to the Mickey Mouse Club, which is my first, I think, really big job. And I have just been in the industry since then. I think for me, it was a divine calling. I instantly knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell stories like now as, you know, an adult, I can look back in retrospect and be like, oh, I really just wanted to tell stories. The people I started in the industry with and in my 20s at a time in my life when their careers were blowing up and they were becoming the most famous people in the world, you know, in my early 20s, I couldn't buy produce. (laughs) And I've had that career where I've been on shows and my career has really taken off. And then the writer's strike happened and I couldn't get work for, you know, two years. I spent a lot of time like looking up at God and being like, why, like, why not me? I work as hard as everyone else. I'm just as talented as everyone else. Why not me? Did you forget about me? And what I didn't realize in those moments was I was actually very deeply being taken care of by God because I just don't know what that kind of fame would have done to me at such a young age. I don't think I would have been able to handle it, to be honest. I definitely know for a fact I would not be the person I am today. 
When I think about that, I think, wow, actually, maybe I was one of the lucky ones, right? Because I still get to do what I love to do. My grandmother, my Nana, she comes in and she goes, you know, I just want you to be on one of those nice Hallmark Christmas movies. So I called my agent and I said, hey, um, I don't know if I could or if I couldn't, but may, what do you feel about calling Hallmark and just seeing if I could be a part of one of their Hallmark Christmas movies? Sure enough, I get an offer for a Hallmark Christmas movie. My grandmother is over the moon. I filmed the movie. It's the last movie of the holiday season. This was seven years ago. It's the last movie of the holiday season and I'm in Blackshear with my family and I'm actually in the Christmas church service and the pastor, you know, you know you've you've made it big in town when the pastor, you know, tells everybody, we gotta wrap this Christmas service up because everybody's gotta go home and watch Nikki on Hallmark. Her movie is airing. And let me tell you, the reaction after that night when that movie aired, the reaction that I received from my hometown people, I had never received a reaction like this. The joy and happiness and warmth and love and hope, it just poured out of them. And I thought, whoa, there's something happening with these movies that is making, it's making people feel a certain way. And I want to be a part of making people feel that way. I taught acting for many years as a way to supplement my income, which taught me how to break down character and scripts. And I realized like, oh, you know, acting, maybe it doesn't feel like it's enough. Like I want to be a part of the actual storytelling, creating the stories. So I went and interned at a friend's production company. He gave me an opportunity there to intern. And after, you know, about a month or so, he made me a creative executive at his production company. And I was able to learn so much about producing and I got the bug right? Oh, this is what it feels like to be able to really be involved in storytelling. So I called Hallmark. I asked if I could get a meeting. I went in and pitched them ideas. They loved them. We moved forward with developing. In the process, they kept hiring me. And you know what? It's a great thing that I had that instinct and I followed that what, what I like to call is it's like that divine. It's kind of like when you really listen to yourself, it is like Jesus calling, right? It's like that part inside of you that's saying like, wake up and pay attention. I'm whispering to you about the direction that I, I want you to go in. And thank God I did because I ended up getting pregnant with Bennett, who is my youngest. And at five months pregnant, I found out that he had four congenital heart defects. And there was a good chance that if he did make it past his first surgery when he was born, that, you know, put it this way, it was a very, very, very scary time. And that first surgery coming out of the gate, there was a giant chance that he didn't make it out of that surgery. And if he did make it out, what condition would he be in? I knew that he would need even if it's, it was successful, it would need and require all hands on deck for me. You know, you would think that something like that would break your faith. But for me, it only deepened my faith because I had no other choice but to lean on God and Jesus and pray and call on all my prayer warriors and everyone I knew out there because I knew if there was a miracle to be had, that miracle was the pairing and the partnership of finding the best pediatric heart surgeon and best team and then letting God take over. So I took off from work completely and um, focused and devoted myself completely to Bennett and at the time learning how to be a writer because I thought, well, if I can't leave him and go act, then I'll create my own stories and I'll learn how to write. 
And it was such a gift and such a blessing. And it got us through the hardest years of my life. And then I started writing for Hallmark, producing more for Hallmark, starring more for, you know, in Hallmark movies. And it, that takes us up to where we are today. And so, you know, that little whisper inside of me seven years ago that said, pay attention to this, this matters, the way that you're making people feel, that has ended up becoming such a giant part of my life today. It's just always been about Jesus. I love Jesus so much. I love how Jesus walked through this world. When you really know Jesus, and if you are really walking in the way, then you are meeting every person in every situation like this. You are coming to it with love, with empathy, with compassion. You're removing judgment, condemnation, excommunication. You're removing hate. And you're literally saying, hi, I have come to just be in community with you. I don't care about the color of your skin. I don't care about your gender. I don't care about your socioeconomic level. I don't care about what religious faith you're in. I don't care about anything. What I care about is, are you in need? Can I help you? Can I pray for you? Let's be in community together. That's how Jesus lived his life. So going into this holiday season, I'm really in a different place. And, you know, we do this beautiful thing at Children's Hospital where anybody can be a part of this. You can essentially be Santa for a family at the holidays. And these families that have to spend their Christmas in, you know, in the hospital. The thing that Christmas has come to mean to me, especially as I've gotten older, Christmas really is about giving back. It's, again, going back to Jesus and going back to walking in the way and going to where the need is. So these families write down a wish list, right? And you get to go and fulfill the wish list. So there's sometimes there's three people in a family. Sometimes there's seven people in a family. But you get to essentially sponsor a family, fulfill their Christmas wish list. You wrap all the presents and you deliver them to Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and then they deliver them to the family on Christmas morning. And it has become an annual tradition for our family. It's what I think Christmas is really about, you know? It's about remembering what's most important. Are we alive? Are we breathing? Are we here? Are we honoring the ones that we've lost? Are we being good to other people? Are we giving back? That's Christmas. That is what it looks like to walk in faith. It is to go where the need is. It is to go toward the suffering and say, you are not alone. I am here and hold your hand out and take somebody else's hand and walk with them. That's what changes your life. To learn more about Nikki and her work, follow her on social media and be sure to watch The Gift of Peace on the Hallmark Channel this holiday season. Stay tuned to Pat Bradley's story after a brief message. Jesus Listens, the best-selling 365-day daily prayer devotional from Sarah Young, is now available for children. This book invites your children and you into an ongoing conversation with God growing a meaningful prayer life and closer relationship with Him. Kids will learn how to pray honest prayers and know that Jesus is always listening to them. This book will equip parents who want to teach their kids how to pray and talk to God, reassure their children that God is always with them, and help their kids to read Bible verses each day. This inspirational book for kids ages 8 to 12 makes a perfect gift for Christmas, birthdays, graduation celebrations, back to school, baptisms, Sunday school awards, or first communions. Jesus Listens, 365 Prayers for Kids is a wonderful tool to help your children read scripture and pray every day of the year. Available wherever books are sold.
Our next guest is Pat Bradley, founder of Crisis Aid International, one of the first organizations to show up in no-go zones where starvation, disease, and danger are a part of everyday life. Pat shares how he found himself moved to go to places where no one had been willing to go and how that changed his life and his ministry. My name's Pat Bradley, and I am the co-founder of Crisis Aid International with my wife, Susan. Susan is my best friend. She's the love of my life, and we have two grown kids, six grandchildren. Prior to going full-time in ministry with Crisis Aid, I was in the advertising business, and I was a partner in an agency for about 35 years. So in my growing up years, I was born and raised in St. Louis, and you know, I can't say that I had a dream of this is what I want to do when I become an adult or when I grow up. But I remember going back. I was born and raised as a Catholic in the Catholic Church. And I remember all throughout grade school that like twice a year, these Catholic missionary priests would come, especially from Africa. And they would just like have the whole service and the whole service was them sharing their stories and what it was like and the people. And I remember as a little child being so fascinated with all of that. And I remember how it really touched my heart and, and would want to like, okay, I'm leaving here, you know, mom, dad, what can we do to help them? You know, and they need money. Maybe we can do a fundraising thing, but just always being touched by the stories of the missionaries and what they were able to do to help people. And so, you know, and the other thing I always, as a child, always believed life was a great adventure. So it was like, you know, if we can't have fun doing something, why are we going to even think about doing it? And so I've kind of just carried that attitude throughout my um, childhood into high school. And, you know, it kind of got me into trouble and led me down some bad paths that I shouldn't have really gone down. However, looking back on that now, I see that God used all of those times to get me to one of the things I really, really wanted to do, though, was be able to help people in a way that was significant. For about probably 10 or 15 years, I would use my vacation times to do mission trips. And I was, those consisted of really working, like I volunteered with Open Doors, a couple other ministries. And I really loved what I did. I loved my work, my company, my employees. Uh, I loved God. And just life was really good. I was on this board of an organization called International Christian Concern based in Washington, D.C. area. It's a great organization. We were getting these reports from South Sudan. And so the founder and I had a conversation and decided, let's go on a fact-finding trip to South Sudan and see if what we're hearing is really true. And we really knew nothing beyond that. So we went and found myself in South Sudan. We spent two weeks on the ground seeing things that were just atrocities, just seeing things that were beyond anything I could comprehend on my own. And so the last day in the country, we came upon a group of people and and it was about 70 men, women and children. These were the survivors. The village had been attacked the night before and we were in the middle of nowhere, just on the edge of the desert. It was like 120 degrees. We kind of stumbled upon these people. Uh, We had nothing to give to them. They had nothing either. And they were literally hundreds of miles from food, water and shelter. I felt utterly hopeless. Like, what am I going to be able to do in the midst of needs beyond anything that human beings can describe? At the time, Colin Powell called it the worst atrocities in mankind were going on in South Sudan. And here I find myself in the middle of all of this, a single individual. What am I going to do? What could I possibly do? And this was our last day in South Sudan and we needed to head back. And so I remember as we were pulling away from this group of survivors, looking back over my shoulder, that just began to become obvious that, you know, somebody had to do something in these hopeless situations. And God really did put it on my heart that doing nothing is no longer an option. So that was the genesis. That was how basically Crisis Aid was born. Beginning our work was in no-go, but we called the no-go zones in South Sudan. And really what these were, these were areas in South Sudan that the government of 
the northern part of Sudan, forbid any aid, forbid the UN to go into these areas, because this is literally where they were attacking the people. They didn't want anybody in the world to see what they were really doing. So the airspace was supposed to be shut off. The UN, uh, very complicit with the government of Sudan, and never did go into any of the areas that they considered were no-go zones. So for us, we were a small organization. At the time, it was just basically me (laughs) and a friend of mine who had an organization in South Africa. So being a very small organization, we had the freedom to be able to go in because we didn't have a bunch of rules and regulations that said we had to get all kinds of corporate approval and what have you. We had contacts that knew how to get stuff into the no-go zones. And so that's what we used. And we basically did it ourselves to work in those areas because that's where the greatest need was. And God always showed up for us. So, But we also knew at the time that God sent us there and God protected us. And what also the other thing is becomes almost paralyzing to hear the stories and to experience the the needs of people. I mean, literally to sit with people who have nothing. So the no-go zones were areas where no one was going to help people. And we found ourselves were the only ones in there doing something. I've now been in 11 countries where we've worked and been in situations beyond my capacity or my ability to do anything to understand and to always see how God never lets us down. It has really taught me that on a daily basis that it goes back to all about relationship with Jesus. There's been seasons in my life where I want to say I didn't always follow God on a daily basis. Uh, I remember the first time somebody told me of Jesus calling was actually here in, in our office. And one of our team had just gotten it. And she said to me, oh, this is an incredible devotional. Listen to this. And she read me one day's passage. And I was floored. I mean, it was like, holy cow, I've never heard anything like that. And so I I grabbed the book from her and I spent the next 20, 30 minutes just reading different things. And it was just like a conversation that Jesus is having with us you know, at our level, you know, speaking in our language and bringing his divinity in the context of my everyday life to help me understand and take that vision of Jesus off of the Bible page and put him into the real world that I live in. And that Jesus Calling was really the first book I see that I've ever read or devotional to do that. Now I have this vision and this passion to see people to get out of the church pew and become all that they can be, what God wants them to be. And many times when I speak, I have people come up to me later and say, you know, I'm just waiting to hear, you know, what God's will is for my life. But I think for more often than not, we use that as an excuse to just not do anything. God can use you. And there's a lot more freedom in God's will than I believe we want to uh, admit. I just got the Jesus Listens devotional and oh my gosh, is that not amazing? Jesus Listens, February 8th. Loving Savior, you brought me out into a spacious place. You rescued me because you delighted in me. I know that your delight in me wasn't based on any worthiness that was in me. You freely chose to lavish your love on me, bringing me out of slavery to sin into a spacious place of salvation. Since my best efforts were utterly insufficient to save myself, you rescued me and clothed me in your own perfect righteousness. Help me to wear this clothing of salvation with overflowing joy, living as a child of light, secure in your radiant righteousness, in your righteous royal name, Jesus. To learn more about the ongoing projects at Crisis Aid International, visit crisisaid.org. If you'd like to hear more stories about following your gut and stepping out in faith, check out our interview with Emily Chang. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we'll hear from podcaster and pentatonics beatboxer Kevin Olasola who shares how he discovered the real definition of success. We have the success formula, which is success equals personal alignment plus self-development times faith. You have to develop yourself. You have to align yourself to Christ. But now the faith portion, that's your multiplier because only God can do it. 
only God can do what he's called for you. You're trying to bring the will of heaven down to earth through your vessel. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.